This week, we are getting to know another one of our Grace members, Pamela Chavez. Many of you know Pamela from Grace Coffee, or you've seen her on the stage with Grace Theater. Today, we get to hear how she uses her gifts in creative arts to show others God's story. I'm your host, Aaron Miller, pastor of equipping at Grace Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. Welcome to Magnify. It is a pleasure sitting down with the famous, and you are famous and you probably don't know it, and people probably don't know that they know who you are. You are Pamela Chavez. Yes. And if you've ever been to Grace Coffee on a Sunday morning or throughout the week, you've seen her. Maybe you didn't talk to her, but she knows what you like. And so thank you for being here. Pamela. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How long? You've been at Grace for how many years now? Uh, about 12. Yeah. And then you started working when? I signed up to volunteer as soon as it opened. So the first year, okay. I volunteered under Stephanie, at that time, Van Lake. That's right, yeah. And now Hanley, Stephanie Hanley. Yes. Yeah. And as the coffee shop continued to expand, they needed to hire so she could do some other things, yeah. um, do paperwork and all that. So they hired me part-time, and I worked through her. And then when Micah came along and That's worked right. for him, yeah. and then he decided to leave, <laughs> We will never With a forgive wonderful, him for yes, that. I know. <laughs> but I learned so much from both of them. But I cannot remember. I still can't remember the exact year of the coffee shop because I feel like it just kind of emerged onto the scene. Do you remember the year that that I started? I think it was eight years ago. It'll be nine coming August. Okay. Yeah. I think. Wow. So we've That's been, crazy. We, yeah. I know. It really has been. And yeah, it's a great resource to have. Some people only know of the coffee shop on a Sunday morning, but. Uh, you know, that's when it's crazy and you have all your volunteers and going crazy behind the counter there and serving the Grace family, which we appreciate. But during the week, it's like, oh, it's nice. And occasionally you see people in the community, which is yes, fantastic. Yes, they come up. We have some regulars who may have never been to our church or they, and they start coming regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Do you get to know them a little bit? Do you... We do, yes. And then a few of them, like somebody looking for a new job, and they've kind of connected with a few of us, and then you don't see them again, and you wonder, oh, I hope they got that job, you know, sure. tell them that you're praying for them, and oh. uh, you kind of have to push that out, however, sure. Sure, sure, sure. whether that's something appropriate without scaring them, because you don't want to scare them off, but it has a, a cool vibe, I think, during the weekday. It's a coffee shop. Yeah. What do they just, they find us through Yelp? Yes, Yelp, Google Maps. Okay. Um, Instagram. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, people give reviews, and then they go looking. They go for a little yeah, coffee looking experience. looking for a new uh, third wave, so-called third wave. It is kind of nice to meet people in the community up on the campus throughout the week. And, I mean, even people that have lived in Santa Clarita for many years, mm -hmm. they didn't know that, you know, there was a place like what we have up here. Yes. With a coffee shop, for sure, you know. But also there's a there's a river and a playground for children and, you know— it's a beautiful campus, and it's kind of a nice environment. It's nice to serve the community in that way. And you do such a nice job. I mean, you're just, you're friendly, you're kind to people, all the things that you need someone to be a face of, like, that is Pamela Chavez. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, did okay, I feel like you're the type of person that you're, you're, you're good with people, you're used to being around a lot of people. At the same time, you'll hold back. You won't be the first to speak, but like... I am incredibly shy. Are you? I was a serious introvert, especially when I was little. If you ever saw class pictures, the girl with her head down was me. You couldn't hardly hear me speak. They were, even my parents had to ask me to speak up. I was just painfully shy. And it was a long slog through high school to teach myself. <laughs> it's more comfortable to actually start talking to people because if you wait too long, yeah. it's too easy to stay in the shell. But when I'm serving people and they're coming in, then I just feel there's more of a freedom. Well, there's also a platform of you kind of know why they're there. Right. At, at least you're yes. assuming that, right? They're not coming for me. They're coming yeah, for yeah, coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. No, I mean, you know, you're, you're very kind. You're sweet. You're soft-spoken. 
But at the same time, you've, you've chosen to be in situations and in contexts where you're up in front of people. So you're either serving them, but also know that, you know, you have a passion for theater. Theater. I have a degree in theater. Yeah. <laughs> Is that crazy? A lot of shy people. So, okay, talk to me about the shy girl with her head down, <laughs> right, to then getting on stage and acting. Well, my mom who was involved with a professional children's theater group, mm. put me into acting classes for kids in order to try to get me to speak, <laughs> to did you, talk. Did you hate that at I first? I don't remember ever really participating. <laughs> <laughs> but because of my love for literature mm. and playing imaginary play when mm. I was little, being by myself, I think there was a great draw for that. So when I got older in high school, I took some outside acting classes, didn't really think about pursuing it, did theater at college, and was waiting to go to grad school. I thought I was going to be a history or a literature professor, mm. but I took a year off and got a, a few modeling jobs and started taking acting classes and modeling classes. And somebody told me, you should audition for American Academy of Dramatic Arts after I did a play, Our Town. Mm. So I did, and I got accepted, and it just seemed like God was going, okay, that's the way you're going to go, and wow. so I got another degree there. <laughs> so, okay, so if you're kind of introverted, right, whenever you're in a context like the stage or performing, do you do you get nervous? Do you get, or do you feel like you're in your zone, like that's what you're, you're made for? That's what I'm made for. I feel that. I feel like I can have conversations with people. I have somebody else's words that... I'm relying on, mm -hmm. and yet making them my own. So I'm not being judged for who I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then once again, it's that literature thing. It's the breathing life into words yeah. and finding God's message through that, no matter what kind of theater it is. Yeah. I mean, you've been active with Grace Theater for a while as well, right? They started in 2001, I think. I wasn't here at okay. that time. Okay, okay. And they worked on a lot of workshops and plays. And I think Sherilyn Haig mm -hmm. had joined them, and then they— took like a year or two off and jumped into a new workshop. And I saw that in the Grace Weekly and yeah, yeah. thought, oh, okay, <laughs> let's go back to this. So how long have you been with Grace Theater? Nine years, maybe nine years. Wow, yeah. That's a unique thing to our church. You know, not every church has something like that. Right. I was with another church who had a Christian theater group called Advent Theater. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore. But I started doing that after I had my kids, and I realized that the acting world in mm. the real world just mm -hmm. wasn't. Got a knife held on me backstage once. I was really? invited to do a movie that I wouldn't want to do. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and commercials that you auditioned for. Just, I thought, this is not right. This isn't, right. I, can't, I can't do this at then the Advent Theater came along, and that was wonderful, but they ended. And now we have an opportunity to show the redemption of that art, right? Yes. What well, I think is a beautiful yes, thing. And so you, you take you take playwrights, from what I understand, that might have a different origin, but then we, we add a biblical message or a worldview message mm -hmm. to it. Is that Would that be correct? Yeah, because God's story is in all of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. Now, what do you mean by they, that? Well, that's, I was going to say, yeah. sometimes they try to twist that, mm -hmm. but... He created us. We all have that creative spark. Yeah. And the choices that we make are either going towards him or rejecting him. Hmm. That's all part of it. And every play has that in it. Yeah, that's been a major theme, I think, just pastorally, a major theme for us this past year, as we, we've talked about telling a better story. The, the right. reality is within humanity, there is this link to our connection to a narrative-based understanding of life. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And so there is the protagonist, the antagonist. There is good triumphing over evil, which everyone wants. Right. We, we actually have points of reference from every Disney movie to any playwright. There is this connection to understanding the desire for certain outcomes universally. You know, so whether you're rich, you're poor, whether you're over 40, under 40, whatever ethnicity, there's still this commonality that all these people on a continuum or on a spectrum desire the same sort of outcome where good triumphs over evil, right? Where the light of truth comes to bear on maybe a foggy or dense situation uh, where there's justice served, you know? And so it's just like interesting. And when we had that men's conference, you weren't there, but you know. No, I wasn't. <laughs> that, was, that was what the conference kind of revolved around was the idea that, no, that there's beauty 
in the universe that God created. There's beauty within us who were made in his image. And ultimately, that's a better outcome and story than anything the natural worldview would have or kind of a nihilistic worldview would have, you know, which is just being dead inside, <laughs> you know, which is not beautiful and gives right. no hope whatsoever. Yeah, I, I think some of the Hollywood hmm. trying to, instead of bringing out that, they're bringing out the ugliness and the wonder why nobody's coming to see, pushing mm. this narrative that's, instead of art being a way to emphasize beauty or mm. they're trying to take the ugly side and bring that, as a, yeah. at the forefront, yeah. losing money, but they're still going towards pushing that because people don't want to see that. They do want, as you yeah. said, to see the light coming out of the darkness. It's psycho- the- I, I, look, I, I, I'll say it psychologically exposes kind of the nerve of the flesh that mm-hmm. there is something that you desire that you can't necessarily put your the, the finger on your pulse of. So, you know, I, I we have lost neighbors and friends and you see them desiring things that are yes. actually part of our worldview but they can't quite describe why they desire that. And all they know is that anytime they, they, they go against the grain of what God has made to be natural, they find themselves depressed, right. frustrated, angry, you know. And so it's a wonderful opportunity. Again, going back to Grace Theater, it's yes. a wonderful opportunity to use the arts as a platform to express truth, the worldview, the beauty of, of that worldview. Um, and so I'm, I'm very pleased that we have a ministry like that. Yeah, and also to show people who are not used to coming to a church if they're invited or they see an ad for one Mm -hmm. of our shows and they come up, dare to come up the hill and go in there and they, oh, Christians can actually put on something that's of good quality. Mm. They're fun. They're having fun. They're not hitting me over the head with some message that I don't want to hear. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an opportunity to show that the cultural depiction of Christianity is, is not true to form. Right. I mean, unfortunately, there are times where it is, but that's not us, right? Now, I did, just so the folks know, I did your membership interview, was that before COVID? I feel like it was right in the middle of was it. it right I think it was outside. We met outside. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we did We did the interview. And I got to hear kind of your life story. And I just, jaw to the floor, was like, this sister has seen things. She has been places. <laughs> I mean, you've already kind of just, it was a throwaway comment. Yeah, I had a knife pulled on me backstage and, uh, you know, <laughs> had the, it was like, whatever, you know. So talk to me about kind of where you're from, where's home base, how did you end up in Santa Clarita? Tell us about your family. The floor is yours. Go. Okay. Well, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. My dad's family settled in Arizona before it was a state. They left Kansas. My great-grandfather was a a Methodist preacher who went towards Mm -hmm. the Independent Holiness Mm -hmm. Church, and they decided to move out of Kansas to get away from the big city where there was lots of evilness and (laughs) set up a Christian school, dormitory, a broom factory, a church. My great-grandfather did everything. Hmm. Um, And my dad came from a very intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can see you're trying to like, you're trying to think, yeah. well, what word should I use? I know he said when he was like five, when he and his family moved back to Old Paths, Peoria, Arizona, the first time he heard his grandfather speak, he ran out of the church when he was about five because terrified him. <laughs> it was sure. the brimstone. Yeah, <laughs> hellfire brimstone. Yeah. yeah, right. But anyway, so, and then my mom came out of a non-practicing Catholic and agnostic family, although she went to church and she also met my dad at Whitworth College, which is in Spokane, Washington, though they were there when Pastor Haig was little. Yeah, yeah, that's right. (laughs) They moved to Arizona because that's where all my dad's family was, and it was a Christian home, Mm -hmm. and I think it was Ingrid that had talked about it was just always there and always believed, and I never had a big, like— moment. Yeah, that's yeah. true for Ingrid. You know, my wife and I, we have that parallel experience where it was always there, but it wasn't necessarily engaged with. For me, right. for me, it was always there. But when my parents divorced and through just a lot of confusing influences about what the church was, kind of competing influences, you had a liberal influence with mainline denominations coming from my biological father. Um, you had then more of an evangelical influence coming from my my, my mom and um, you know, my, my, my new family uh, with the Millers. And so I was kind of confused as to what that was all about, which led to a very angry 
confused young man until finally the Lord, I think, revealed himself in powerful ways when I was 18. My sister, when I was in sixth grade, had brought the Four Spiritual Laws little booklet because she was more of the rebel. (laughs) And she actually came to a very uh, profound awakening. Hmm. And she said she came into my room and told me, this is more important than just believing that Jesus is our Savior. You really have to make an effort. You have to, it has to be something that you're passionate about. Mm. I don't think she said it in that words, but I was 10, so. Sure. But it just made sense. Oh, But how would a 10-year-old talk about faith? And passion seems to make sense. Yeah. It's trust. It's trust. Yeah, it's uh, Making it more important than just going through life going, yeah, I'm going to church. I love going to church. I like hearing that kind of thing, going to Sunday school. But I chose to go to the private Christian school that my great-grandfather had started Mm -hmm. originally was called Old Paths, following from Jeremiah 616, Mm -hmm. which is like the Weed family. Weed is my maiden name. Yes, W-E-E-D. So I was going to church at a fairly mainline, but still back in that time, Mm -hmm. the congregation was pretty conservative. The changing in what was taught in seminary, I think, hadn't really, the older pastors hadn't quite gone towards the more as mainline churches were starting to go more liberal, mm-hmm. it, it yeah, hadn't right. got to our church. It was still that 19, even though it wasn't the 50s, but that 1950s, sure. 1960s, very conservative, um, just family. Yeah. So I was getting more in-depth Bible education at high school and was really drawn to youth ministry, became really involved with that denomination, had a national, state and national youth program, which I got mm-hmm. involved with. I thought I was going to go to do some kind of ministry, whether it's with the youth. Mm -hmm. And I went to Phillips University, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a sister school to TCU up in Oklahoma. Yeah. The classroom sizes, I think the largest classroom I had, people, was maybe 15. Oh, wow. Took a whole semester of Chaucer, and there were three people in the class. Oh, is that right? So (laughs) I had a wonderful education, a wonderful time, but— It's unique. I also saw what was starting to be taught Mm. theologically Mm -hmm. and that just didn't feel comfortable and love history, love literature. So I got a double major in that and uh, exhausted myself. That's why I took that year off (laughs) and got completely sidetracked and started doing modeling and acting. Hi, everyone. This is April Larson, director of Grace Kids, and we want to invite you to join us for Summer Adventure, June 26th through the 30th as we travel on a pirate adventure to discover what God is like. We will teach and model God's word through music, drama, crafts, small groups, and so much more. You won't want to miss it. Summer Adventure is for kids entering kindergarten through sixth grade. For more details, to register your kids or to register as a volunteer, visit our website at the link in the description of this episode. We hope to see you there. And so how did you then find your way in that direction? So, I mean, when I think about the foundation that was laid for you from your grandfather's influence that was more of a fundamentalist yeah. foundation, because it's not very typical of a story that you go from that as a foundation to then creative arts and you yes. know, where you ended up. How did that kind of migrate in that direction? Do you remember? My dad is a poet. Mm. His soul is a poet. He is kind and gentle. He is the personification of Mr. Rogers, Mm. but with all that truth and Mm. love. But he told us stories at night. Sometimes I didn't know it was Brigadoon that he was telling us a story of Mm. or a dream that he had. And he would write poems and little stories for us. So they were really, really formative for you? Yes. Mm -hmm. They were both, both my parents were teachers for most of my time until my dad had to take over his father's business. But I think that's what inspired that creative. But my sister's an an amazing writer. Most of my nieces are dancers. My cousin is an actor. Yeah. It just, for some reason, our generation and then the next generation, they're all creative. Artsy people. Is everyone in California now? No, everybody's in Arizona, except for my kids. And then my sister has dancer daughter in New York and a dancer daughter in Chicago okay. and then a pianist singer in Tucson. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we're just, I don't know. So after your time in Oklahoma with your education there, how did then you end up? I went back home. Went back home. 
stayed there for a year, got involved with Plaza 3 Modeling Agency, and that's when they told me to audition for the American Academy. And I had the choice between going to the California school or the one in New York, and New York scared me. I'd never been there. Mm-hmm. Never been to California either, except to Oakland to visit my grandparents, but I just seemed... It was at Pas- in Pasadena at that time. Oh, okay. I surprised my parents said, okay, because that's a crazy thing yeah. to decide to do. Yeah. <laughs> How uh, old were you at the time? So I was... 22. You set out on your own, came to California. Yep. Okay. And went to school and loved it. I had to make some choices because in that school, obviously, one of our exam plays was chorus line. Mm. And you take the part that they give you. They asked me to do a role that I didn't feel comfortable doing. Mm-hmm. And yet I chose to go ahead and do it. Anyway. <laughs> But another thing that I had to do, I did a play. I was very, still very naive, even though I had gone to college, and Mm. a play that had a lot of bad words. They Mm. and she was a very angry character. It was a semester where they made you play roles that you wouldn't normally be cast in. Mm. I didn't realize till like five years later that the character I was playing was also lesbian. Just didn't. Dawn of me, I could not understand who this person was. You're just saying you were just naive to kind of how the world was having its way within the arts? In part okay. that, but also not even understanding that lifestyle, that that was oh, just sure. maybe my blinders were still. Well, it's, well you know, you, you learn part of the growing up process. You learn what is normative for some is not normative for yeah. others, right? Right. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. So, which is why I didn't do that part. I did not do very well. I think I got a C on that. Okay. <laughs> that so then how did, you know, at, at some point in time, did you make a decision that this is just, if I continue on this path, it's too much of a compromise. I can't continue on. I mean. Yes. So I graduated. I got, I did get an agent and went on auditions, was told I'm pretty much a dime a dozen. Hmm. So I thought, well, I preferred live theater anyway, so that you can choose better. You can actually look and see what they're casting Hmm. and choose to audition or not instead of your agent saying you're going to this commercial audition and this whatever, and you don't know really what the part is or what you're going for. And that was enjoyable there uh, to do the live theater and audition. You get a part, even though you'd get some really hole-in-the-wall theaters sure, uh, sure. and stages. And that was what happened with the, the knife. Oh, okay. Our s- props were in the alley. The backstage was an alley. It's actually in Burbank. And we had a bunch of bottles and some boy rode by on a bicycle and thought that was real beer there. And I was dressed like a boy because I was a tomboy and I had all my hair in a mm-hmm. hat. And he said, you got beer there? I said, no, that's just a prop. There's nothing in there but water. Well, he didn't listen. And he Took a big drink and found out it was water and got very mad, threw the bottle against the wall. And I just saw his arm go by me, and I ducked, and I saw the knife. Holy cow. And luckily, two more cast members came by, and he rode off with a string of obscenities as he drove off. But anyway, that was scary. I thought, okay, I'm not going to audition for any of these really small voice yeah. things anymore. But I don't have the kind of resume to do the Amundsen or Dorothy Chandler. Mm-hmm. I don't have an equity card or anything. I do have my SAG card, but that's not going to get me anywhere. And my mom told me about this church that had Advent Theater. And so I went, started going there. And it was the same denomination that I grew up in. Mm-hmm. The heart of the people there were really amazing. Advent Theater was started by Christians that were actually part of the original Godspell cast. Oh. So there were a few Uh of them that actually, some of them went back to their Christianity doing Godspell Uh or became aware of, oh, wow. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that that, so they had done that. For the people who don't know, you want to describe Godspell there? Yeah, Godspell is a play that started out as a thesis Mm -hmm. at Carnegie Mellon, I think that's where they started. A very 1960s late 60s God, Jesus parable, maybe, of the book of Matthew Mm. with music and very hippie dress stuff. (laughs) And it ended up becoming popular. It went to off-Broadway, to Broadway. They did a movie. And the girl that plays the character Gilmer, 
yeah. was our artistic director at Advent Theater. Uh-huh. Her family was, um, I think her father was a Lutheran pastor. Hmm. And then one of the music directors, not Paul Schrader, but Stephen Reinhardt, hmm. also became the a Christian. And he was the choir director at the church that I was going to, that had Advent Theater. Do you want to mention the name of the church or no? First Christian Church of North Hollywood. Okay. Is it still there? It is still there. Okay, but it's, it's quite different, I imagine. Huh? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, right. they, they, <laughs> when they started changing the hymnal uh-huh. and changing the pronouns of that was men the, That to... was the, the first set of signs, huh? Yeah. yeah I yeah. just thought, okay. Because there's a point where do you leave because you're not happy or do you stay and fight for God's word being yeah, true? Yeah, and sometimes it's hard to know. And anyone who has ever had to stay and fight, They've been faced with the, should I have done this? Yeah. But now I've started. I mean, you see Martin Luther dealing with that when he wanted to reform the Catholic Church. Martin Luther didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it until he realized that this was just not going to happen. So he broke away, right? Right. Yeah. So we did leave the church and everything was kind of falling apart because there was such a big shift that was happening within just a couple of years. Happened very quickly. Yes. Yeah. So the Advent Theater broke apart. We stopped going. We went to another church out here. I live with Grace Baptist from my backyard, but it looked so big and I was afraid. Mm. Once again, the big, yeah, fear, fear of the big. Yeah. But a friend of ours who started Lake Hills. Yeah, in Castaic, right? Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Her daughter was a ballet dancer with my daughter and she said, you should try Grace Baptist. I think that's where you'll fit. And, and what year was that? Do you remember? I mean, 2000, I, it was like the same year that the Hags came. I was going to say, yeah, 2009 then. Yeah, about that. I think so about my daughter years. had just graduated from about, high school. About 14 years. Yeah. You've seen a lot of change at Grace since you've, yes, you've arrived. Yes, the, the mods. Yeah. The Grace oh, Coffee yeah. wasn't there. Grace there Coffee. were no, the patio was not the patio. <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, tell us a little bit about your family. Well, my husband, his name is Manny Chavez. We met me doing the old, you're an actor and you're working at a restaurant and yeah. a fellow coworker introduced me to him. Kind of a blind date that okay. was. There you and go. He's a very kind, gentle man. He is a kind. Yes. Man. And so we've been married for 30, I want to say this right. What year is this? <laughs> It'll be 35 years in, in November. All right. And we have two children. My daughter, Anastasia, is 32, and she is executive pastry chef. Yeah. At a Michelin star restaurant. How exciting yeah, is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was actually on Guy's Grocery Games a couple of years ago. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh. And my son is. Whom I met the other day. He was in the coffee shop. Yes. Yeah. He is my. My daughter is amazing. She's very funny and full of life. My son has got a lot of my dad's poet soul oh. in him. He's a very gifted musician. Mm. And he also he teaches children jujitsu. He competes in jiu-jitsu, and he's also a personal trainer. That's fantastic. And he's moving to Texas. Is he? Where you can afford to live. Yeah, where in Texas is he going? I think he found an apartment in Louisville, Louisville, Louisville? which is okay. north northern suburbs of Dallas. Okay. Beautiful. There's lakes. and. Yeah, I got a sister who lives north of Dallas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How's your mama heart doing? Uh, it hasn't registered yet. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. I'm so sorry. He would take me to see, like for Christmas, a Christmas gift would be going to see Singing in the Rain actually on film at Tarantino's place down in, he's got a old-fashioned movie theater. Mm-hmm. And then Gene Kelly's widow would yeah, yeah, be right. there to do interviews. Uh. We went to see La La Land for the first time, the first year, week that it came out, and the um, music director was there talking. Oh, so we wow. do that kind of stuff. Watch Lord of the Rings and Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that he's <laughs> that's hard. I mean, I personally, obviously, when I left the East Coast and came out here, even though I didn't live in the same state as my my parents, I was I was at least a four hour drive, you know. And so yeah, I know what it's like to to have that and you know, my heart goes out to you. <laughs> that's <laughs> all right. You. That's all right. Well, just wrapping things up here, you're a wonderful you're just a great conversation. You're like, you're calming, you're soothing, you're interesting. I can sit and talk to you forever. What, though, would you want the Grace family to know about you that you don't really talk about all that much? And then how could the Grace family pray for you? What's something interesting that's like, oh, who's Pamela Chavez? As if you haven't shared enough already. Okay, besides the fact that 
I was a ballroom dancer for about seven years yeah. and competed. And my great five times great grandfather is Daniel Boone. <laughs> oh, <is> that... <laughs> That's the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember you mentioning that. Um, that was a lot. I told you a lot already. <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, yeah. To pray for for your son's travels. Or... For my son's yeah. travels and his future. Both my kids have. My daughter has a boyfriend, and my son has a girlfriend, and they seem very serious. So I'm hoping for okay marriage and <laughs> little ones. <laughs> yes, you can say it, grandbabies. Grandbabies. Yeah, yeah. Well, Pamela, we love you. You are a dear friend and sister to the Grace family, and now more people are gonna like uh, you know ask you questions about at least what we laid as a foundation today. So you got to be ready for that as you're serving coffee. Okay. And hopefully, <laughs> and this is a wonderful opportunity to recruit. Volunteers for Grace Coffee. Yes. So if you want to please. give a plug for that, you, you, please. <laughs> we have a lot of fun, and there's a wonderful group of young people. I'm Honestly, like mom. What would, what, would they, what would they do? Would they just kind of show up, buy coffee, and say, "Hey, I'd like to volunteer"? Yes, you can do that. You can email me at my Grace Baptist Pamela Chavez at gracebaptist dot org and say you're interested, and we can set you up. And you can do as the minimum of just warming up scones and pouring coffee, mm -hmm. or eventually learning how to work the register. Or even learn how to do latte art. That's the whatever, <laughs> whatever is your heart desires. <laughs> All right, sis, we love you. Thanks for being here. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Magnify. Hopefully next week you'll be able to join us for another episode. Thanks for streaming. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to Magnify Podcast so you never miss an episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others. Post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask in our mailbag, you can email them to magnify at gracebaptist.org and we will answer them on the show. Thank you so much for streaming.